a heated confrontation between two enraged motorists in Indianapolis erupted into deadly gunfire one evening in July of 2024, leaving the newlywed dead and his family devastated. Cell phone footage showed 29-year-old Gavin Dessour approaching the driver's side window of a pickup truck on foot with what appeared to be a gun in his hand. He tried to punch the driver who swatted his hand away while pointing his finger in the man's face and verbally berating him. The pickup truck driver opened fire on Dessour who collapsed on the pavement and died from his injuries. Police questioned the shooter but let him go after determining that he may have acted in self-defense. During an interview with local station WTHR, Dessour's wife, Cynthia Zamora, described her husband as a hard-working and generous family man who was murdered in cold blood. Whether or not Dessour's death is considered a murder in the eyes of the law remains to be seen. In the meantime, the investigation is ongoing. Number 20. Road Rage Motorist Messes With The Wrong Driver 50-year-old truck driver Darren Waite was driving home near the English town of Wigan in July of 2024 when his dash cam captured footage of a white van and a white hatchback vying for the same traffic lane on a roundabout. The car veered diagonally and rammed into the van, disabling both vehicles. A man exited the car and approached the van on foot. He began throwing punches through the driver's side window, prompting the van driver to exit his vehicle. An all-out brawl broke out between the two men. The van driver delivered three powerful punches to his opponent, then grabbed him by the legs and lifted him into the air, while the smaller man's young son sobbed hysterically at the sight of his dad getting beaten up. Impatient to get home after a long day at work, Waite exited his truck and separated the men, then told them to exchange insurance information. They never did, but Waite accomplished his goal of clearing up the road and continuing along his drive home. Number 19. Eric Rohan Justin As a TikTok influencer, teenager Ava Majory is unfortunately used to dealing with the occasional stalker. The most alarming of these incidents occurred in July of 2021 when 18-year-old Eric Rohan Justin traveled from Ellicott City, Maryland to the Majory family's home in Naples, Florida. Armed with a shotgun, he tried shooting his way through the front door at 4.30 in the morning. The entire family awoke to the noise and Ava's mother retreated to a bedroom with her two brothers. Ava would later describe feeling utterly terrified for her life as her father, Rob, grabbed his gun and returned fire. Justin died from his injuries at a nearby hospital and the shooting was deemed a justified act of self-defense under Florida's Stand Your Ground law. At the time of his death, Justin was carrying two cell phones filled with hundreds of photos of Ava. His obsession with her had started several months earlier when he pursued her relentlessly on TikTok. Ava initially sold selfies to Justin but he started asking for more explicit photos, at which point Rob stepped in and told him to stop contacting his daughter. Justin also continued to send money to Ava even after she blocked him. At that point, the Majories weren't worried about Justin. They even made the mistake of overlooking a friend's warnings after Justin got in touch with the friend and expressed his plans to hurt the family. Rob later told reporters that he assumed Justin didn't have the means to travel from Maryland to Florida, let alone act on any of his threats. Ava had another stalker shortly after the deadly encounter with Justin, but for now she refuses to let her overly attached admirers stop her from continuing with her highly successful TikTok career. Number 18. Rioter receives instant karma. Tragedy struck an entire community in Merseyside, England, in July of 2024, when a mast assailant stabbed three victims to death and injured ten others at a Taylor Swift-themed yoga and dance event. Several nights after the stabbing spree, hundreds of far-right protesters rioted outside a mosque in Southport, interrupting a peaceful vigil that was being held by members of the community. The protesters lit cars, police vehicles, and garbage cans on fire, looted businesses, and threw bottles, bricks, and other items at police. 
as law enforcement tried to quell the unrest. Investigators connected the demonstrators to a right-wing anti-Islam organization called the English Defense League. The protesters came from out of town and used the triple murder as an excuse to go on a politically fueled collective tirade. According to news reports, the riot was partially driven by rumors and speculation about the identity of a teenage suspect who was charged with the stabbings. More than 50 riot officers were injured during the night of violence, including 27 who went to the hospital. In one video that has been making the rounds on social media, a rioter in a grey sweatsuit was struck in the head and face by two bricks, one of which had bounced off a police riot shield before ricocheting smack dab into his face. Just moments later, a third brick struck him square in the crotch. He could be seen grabbing the back of his head, then bending forward in agony with his knees together. Two of his friends helped him walk away after they heard him yelling out in pain. Public officials condemned the violence and urged the public not to make assumptions about the suspect, whose name is being withheld due to his age. Officers from multiple agencies responded to the scene while local off-duty officers put their uniforms on and reported for duty. Law enforcement eventually managed to shut the riot down, but demonstrators caused a lot of physical damage that is still being fixed and cleaned up. In the meantime, Officers in the area have been temporarily granted expanded authority to stop and search people and to send people away from the area. Number 17. Justin Hansen On a seemingly ordinary afternoon in September 2008, high schooler Brittany Marcel walked to her Las Cruz, New Mexico home during her lunch period with plans to eat with her mom. Instead, she was met by a home intruder who beat her mercilessly with a shovel and fled the scene. Marcel barely survived and had to relearn basic everyday tasks like talking, eating and walking. She was also left blind in one eye and deaf in one ear and has undergone countless surgeries to repair the damage to her face and body. At first, the teen had no memory of the nearly fatal assault, but over the years, bits and pieces started to come back to her. She eventually recalled the name of a man she used to work with at a local shopping mall and passed it on to law enforcement in 2017, nearly a decade after the attack. Justin Hansen had been questioned earlier in the investigation and had refused to give police his DNA, so detectives' ears perked up when Marcel mentioned his name. Police surreptitiously obtained a DNA sample from a discarded cup and it was a match to evidence left behind at the crime scene. Hansen maintained his innocence despite the DNA match. He eventually pleaded no contest to aggravated burglary and attempted murder and was sentenced to 18 years in prison but has repeatedly petitioned the court for a reduced sentence. In 2021, a judge shaved more than a year off his sentence after asking for credit for time he spent on an ankle bracelet prior to going to prison. In 2022, Hansen petitioned for another sentence reduction because he said he wanted to see his son graduate high school and go to prom. This didn't seem fair to Marcel, who missed her own prom and graduation because she was recovering from the attack. Much to her relief, the judge denied the request. Hansen's current release date is slated for the year 2036. Back in 2018, footage of a fellow inmate beating him appeared in the media. Marcus Gonzalez attacked Hansen out of nowhere with a punch to the head. He took Hansen to the ground and continued fighting with him until a pair of inmates separated the two. While it's unclear what the fight was about, many people certainly did not feel bad for Hansen especially considering the fact that he got away with his crime for nearly a decade and still refuses to admit his guilt. Number 16. Olandis Hobbs In July of 2024, Florida passed a law, making it easier for authorities to kick squatters off properties that don't rightfully belong to them. 
One of the first defendants to be prosecuted under the legislation was 37-year-old Olandis Hobbs, described by prosecutor Josh James as a squatter on steroids. He used fake documents to take control of a $700,000 condo near Panama City Beach, forcing its 85-year-old owner to continue paying homeowner association fees and property taxes despite not being able to live there. Hobbs had previously squatted at numerous other properties, including in New York State, and spent 18 months in the elderly woman's condo before he was removed. In January of 2023, he was charged with grand theft of more than $100,000, fraudulent use of personal identification information, forgery, and unlawful filing of false documents against real property. By the time his case went to trial during the summer of 2024, the new squatting law had gone into effect. After deliberating for just 35 minutes, the jury found him guilty. He was sentenced to 40 years in prison, followed by 30 years of probation, ensuring that he won't be squatting on anyone's property for decades to come. Number 15. Alan Ray McGrew The 4th of July will forever symbolize tragedy for one South Carolina family following a deadly firework accident in 2024. 41-year-old Alan Ray McGrew was putting on a fireworks show in the driveway of his Somerville home when he lit a large firework and put it on his head to show off. He failed to remove it before it exploded, and emergency responders arrived to find him unresponsive with severe head injuries. McGrew had died instantly, and his wife Paige told investigators that family members were begging him to stop showboating before the fatal accident. She said she didn't even realize the firework was lit until it exploded. The 4th of July was McGrew's favorite holiday. He always wore an Uncle Sam costume during his neighborhood block party and had a strong sense of patriotism. According to a police report, he had been drinking alcohol for several hours leading up to his death. Sadly, a split-second decision to forego fireworks safety cost him his life. Hopefully, the tragedy serves as a cautionary tale to others about how quickly things can go wrong in that type of situation. Number 14. Tony Joe Gunter when a Goodlitzville, Tennessee woman's ex-boyfriend wouldn't leave her alone following their breakup in 2016, she obtained an order of protection and changed her locks. She had ended her two-year-long relationship with 52-year-old Tony Joe Gunter after discovering that he had an extensive and disturbing criminal history. But Gunter showed no signs of intending to honor his ex-girlfriend's desire to be left alone so she made plans to have a sophisticated home security system professionally installed. While the system was being put in, the woman went to a neighbor's house for a quick visit. When she returned, she noticed that her cell phone was missing. She then noticed a pair of feet under her bed and realized that Gunter was hiding underneath it. Fearing for her life, the terrified homeowner shot Gunter in the foot. She kept the gun trained on him while the home security employee dialed 911. After being treated for his gunshot wound at a local hospital, Gunter was booked into custody on multiple charges, including aggravated burglary and stalking. The shooting was deemed justified and the victim was cleared of any wrongdoing. During questioning, Gunter reportedly admitted to taking his ex's cell phone so she wouldn't be able to dial 911. Records show that he served part of a six-year prison sentence and was released in 2019. Number 13. Patricia Rogers After surviving a car wreck in London in 2014, 25-year-old Patricia Rogers filed a civil claim for nearly $636,000, claiming that she could only walk with the assistance of a cane or crutches. She also said that she suffered a debilitating back condition that made everyday tasks difficult. Nearly seven years later, investigators with the insurance company that Rogers filed the claim with noticed some inconsistencies in the medical documents she used to support her case. They uncovered surveillance footage which showed 
Rogers using a cane to enter and exit a medical appointment. While she walked perfectly fine without a cane while walking her dogs later that day, she did not appear to be in any discomfort without the cane. The investigators also uncovered video from the young woman's appearances on the now cancelled Jeremy Kyle show. In the footage, which was captured in 2017 and 2018, Rogers could be seen standing, walking and running across the stage. When confronted with the more recent footage of herself walking her dogs without assistance, Rogers claimed she couldn't use a cane because she had to hold on to the dog's leashes. Furthermore, she said that she was angry during her appearances on The Jeremy Kyle Show, which distracted her from the pain that normally makes her unable to walk unaided. These excuses failed to convince a court that Rogers was innocent, and in 2024, she pleaded guilty to fraud by false representation. She received a 12-month suspended prison sentence and was fined around $640. Number 12. Harold Runnels Jr. In February of 2021, 61-year-old Harold Runnels Jr. knocked on the back door of an elderly couple's Jackson, South Carolina home. He pretended to be looking for a lost dog, then pulled a large knife and forced his way inside. Runnels threw 79-year-old Lois Parrish to the floor and slashed her in the forehead, drawing the attention of her 82-year-old husband, Vietnam War veteran Herbert Parrish. Herbert would later tell Fox 57 that he was convinced Runnels was going to kill him and Lois. Desperate to save their lives, he grabbed the shotgun off the wall and began striking Runnels with the butt. Repeatedly, he hit the home intruder as hard as he possibly could ten times and dialed 911 once he was sure that Runnels was subdued. Aiken County deputies arrived to find Runnels bleeding and unresponsive on the elderly couple's floor. He was taken to the hospital, where he died later that night. The parishes said that they had seen Runnels walking around in their neighborhood on past occasions, but they didn't really know him. Lois speculated that Runnels intended to burglarize the home, and Herbert was cleared of any wrongdoing after it was determined that he had acted in self-defense. Number 11. Kate Corrane Sci-fi fiction writer Kate Corrane achieved something that many aspiring authors only ever dream of when she landed a deal with Del Rey Books. Her novel, Crown of Starlight, was slated for release in May of 2024, but the deal was rescinded by the publisher in late 2023 after Corrine was accused of leaving fake one-star reviews on Goodreads of novels written by mostly non-white competing authors. Readers initially grew suspicious when they noticed a handful of Goodreads accounts that praised Corrine's work while leaving disappointed sounding feedback with various other writers. When the allegations first surfaced, Corrine blamed the negative reviews on a non-existent friend, but she knew that she could no longer deny her actions when a document detailing all her fake Goodreads accounts was made public. Corrine subsequently admitted to making around six fake profiles, but blamed her behavior on drugs and alcohol, claiming that she left the one-star reviews after she suffered a complete psychological breakdown. She said that she might not have been sober or of sound mind while making the posts and announced her intentions to check into a treatment facility for her issues. In her apology, Corrine stated that she took full responsibility for her actions and harbored no ill will toward the authors she victimized, but many people didn't believe her, noting that it seemed like she was blaming her behavior wholly on mental illness and substance use, rather than admitting that she had knowingly made some terrible decisions. People also had a hard time believing that Corrine wasn't specifically targeting writers of color. After the scandal broke, Del Rey Books removed Corrine's book from its 2024 publishing schedule. She was also dropped by her agent, Rebecca Podos, and her book was removed from Illumicrati's monthly subscription box service. Number 10. 
Amari Morgan. 62-year-old Bob Belich had just pulled into the driveway of his Joliet, Illinois home one night in January of 2016 when he was confronted by a pair of bat-wielding men who bludgeoned him to death on the pavement in front of his house. The yard was scattered with sticky notes all stating, reap what you sow, suggesting that the killer had taken Belich's life in an act of vigilante justice over something they believed he had done wrong. Belich's neighbor, 20-year-old Blake Morgan, denied having any knowledge of where the post-it notes came from, claiming they were already in the yard when the altercation with Belich broke out. But investigators found more of the same sticky notes bearing the same message in Morgan's bedroom. Blake and his younger brother, 18-year-old Amari Morgan, were charged with first-degree murder. According to prosecutors, Blake and Amari went to Belich's house to confront him amid an ongoing dispute between their households. A brief argument ensued before the brothers beat him to death. In the days leading up to the deadly confrontation, Belich had behaved strangely. He was seen wandering in the Morgan's yard and made inappropriate comments toward the family, causing the brothers to worry that he was going to hurt their mother or sister. Blake, who is now 28 years old, opted for a bench trial, which meant that a judge would decide his fate rather than a jury. The case finally went to trial in 2022, more than six years after Belich's murder, and the judge found Blake guilty. He was sentenced to 27 years in prison with credit for nearly seven and a half years served and is required to serve 100% of his remaining term. In January of 2024, Amari, who is now 25, pleaded guilty to second-degree murder. He received a 20-year maximum sentence with credit for eight years served. The judge also considered his good behavioral record and the educational credits he earned during his time in county jail and ordered him to serve 50% of his remaining time behind bars. Amari was extremely apologetic at his sentencing and is a model inmate, making it clear that he looks forward to moving on from his criminal past. Number 9. Keisha Kennedy Over a nearly four-year period starting in 2020, 34-year-old Keisha Kennedy of Zanesville, Ohio, made nearly 400 baseless 911 calls, claiming to be suffering from various medical ailments. She often called several times a week and in some cases multiple times in a day. According to prosecutors, the serial 911 abuser used the emergency line for personal entertainment and non-emergency rides to the hospital. Numerous emergency room visits ended with staff members telling Kennedy that nothing was physically wrong with her. By clogging up the phone line and needlessly demanding police resources, Kennedy diverted emergency responders' attention away from people who truly needed help, including one man who died. On another occasion, there was an understaffed response to a fire because some emergency personnel were responding to her latest call. Authorities eventually got fed up with Kennedy's constant 911 calls and charged her with multiple crimes. In July of 2024, she pleaded guilty to felony disrupting public services, felony making false alarms and 25 counts of misdemeanor misuse of 911 systems. She's currently awaiting sentencing. A forensic psychiatrist who evaluated the young woman demonstrated a factitious disorder, which essentially means that she's a habitual liar. Whether her mental state will play a factor in her sentencing remains to be seen. Number 8. Bryce Hodgson Over a three-month period in early 2023, 30-year-old Bryce Hodgson relentlessly stalked a terrified young woman in southeast London. The victim accused Hodgson of entering her bedroom without her permission, texting her with demands that she open her door and sharing his explicit fantasies with her. Hodgson pleaded guilty to a stalking charge and was sentenced to a year of supervision. The judge also issued a five-year order of protection banning him from contacting or going near his victim. Early one morning in January of 2024, Hodgson forced his way into the victim's residence while clad in body armor and armed with a knife, sword, and hatchet. He threatened to kill the people inside the home 
pointed a crossbow at the police and swung a sword at officers, prompting them to respond with deadly force. Hodgson was shot by one of the officers and died at the scene. Number 7. Stranger Slapper Gets a Dose of Her Own Medicine A young girl was walking hand in hand with her mother on a sidewalk in Brazil in June of 2024 when a woman approached from the opposite direction and slapped the child in the face for no apparent reason. The mother tried charging at the stranger but her daughter held her back. In the meantime, a man rushed over, knocked the woman to the ground and kicked her several times as she tried to get up. As bystanders consoled the mother-daughter duo, the woman got off the ground and screamed at the man who had just attacked her. It's unclear why she slapped the girl or what city the incident occurred in, but the man who stepped in to help received widespread praise among social media commenters, many of whom remarked that the woman got what she deserved. Number 6. Vincent Ogero while out to dinner with some friends in College Station, Texas in February of 2021, 19-year-old Vincent Ogero decided it would be funny to fake his own kidnapping as a prank. On the group's receipt, he wrote a note pleading for help and containing a phone number. Ogero left the receipt at the restaurant where it was found by employees who immediately called the police. Responding officers reviewed surveillance footage of the group and noticed that nobody appeared to be in distress. After identifying the suspects, the police visited three addresses before finding Ogero, who apologized for the prank but acknowledged that he knew it would trigger a police response. He was charged with filing a false police report and was released on $5,000 bond, but the outcome of the case is unclear. Number 5. Blake Robinson Early one morning in June of 2024, a 66-year-old Florida man overheard someone trying to break into his truck outside his Brevard County home. He went outside and confronted the wannabe thief, 29-year-old Blake Robinson, who responded by punching the older man in the head and throwing him to the ground. Robinson proceeded to kick the much larger victim in the head but was unable to stop him from getting back on his feet and turning the tables. The homeowner tackled Robinson to the ground and kept him there until police arrived. Robinson received medical treatment for non-serious injuries and was subsequently booked into custody on suspicion of felony battery of a person over the age of 65 and attempted burglary of a conveyance. He remains behind bars with Bond set at $30,000 as he awaits his next court date, which is scheduled for August of 2024. Number 4. Jacob Smith In August of 2023, police in Pleasant Hill, Missouri, received a call from a concerned tipster about a newly sworn-in officer who had just taken his oath days earlier. The caller had seen photos of Smith being sworn in and decided it would be a good idea to let his superiors know about his tendency to post disturbing and derogatory content on social media. According to law enforcement, a lot of the material Smith posted was racist and or homophobic, and some of the inappropriate posts were very recent. The posts included prejudiced memes, highly insensitive political memes, and a statement alluding to the decapitation of African Americans. Smith resigned pretty much as soon as the scandal broke, ending his policing career before it even really began. Pleasant Hill Police Chief Tommy Wright apologized to the public for not finding the offensive posts during the hiring process. He said that the department had unintentionally failed to investigate Smith's social media, which is a customary step they usually take with every new hire. Wright also made it clear that he does not tolerate racism and that he wants Pleasant Hill to be a safe and inviting place for all. Number 3. Intoxicated Thieves Receive Instant Karma Two intoxicated Canadian men were walking in downtown Nanaimo, British Columbia, in April of 2024 when they decided it would be a good idea to steal the sign from a men's clothing store. Surveillance footage captured at 2 in the morning showed one of the men hoisting the other on his shoulders in order to reach the overhead sign. 
The man who was sitting on his friend's shoulders unscrewed the sign with no apparent forethought about how heavy it would be. He was unprepared for its 100-pound weight, and once the final screw was removed, the sign instantly fell, knocking him to the ground face first. The thieves walked away with the sign, but they ended up returning it to the store owner, which was a factor in his decision not to report the theft to the police. Leon Drzwicki told CTV News that he didn't feel a need to file a complaint with the RCMP, Royal Canadian Mounted Police, over something that he considered to be minor, especially since he ended up getting the sign back anyway. But as a small business owner who struggles even in the absence of thefts and vandalism, he also wasn't happy about having his sign stolen. The viral video that was released to the public only captured part of the theft. It took the suspects 15 minutes to get the sign down, and at one point they had actually given up and walked away, only to return with a newfound determination to accomplish the task they came to do. A police spokesperson said that the men would have faced vandalism and theft charges if the crime had been reported, which hopefully served as a reminder that they may not be so fortunate next time. Today's topic was requested by Charles Abernathy User and Roscoe Hayes. If you have any other topics you'd like to learn about, subscribe and let us know in the comments section below. Number 2. Connor Harrison In August of 2023, 25-year-old Connor Harrison fled from the police on a stolen scooter in the English town of Gateshead as an officer chased after him on foot. Harrison lost control of the scooter, veered across the road and struck a curb. He continued trying to flee, narrowly avoiding a pedestrian before he crashed into a garden wall and went flying over the handlebars, landing with such a hard impact that he was knocked unconscious. The scooter had been stolen from a Tesco store earlier that day by someone else. Police were trying to pull Harrison over for not wearing a helmet when he sped off. He broke his eye socket in the crash and was temporarily blinded in that eye. In March of 2024, Harrison pleaded guilty to dangerous driving and driving without insurance. The judge spared him from jail time under the agreement that he maintain employment and stay out of further legal trouble. If you thought that consequences don't hit as hard as dad's belt, Wait until you see how beach trips can turn into a nightmare. Stay tuned till after number one because we've got our previous video for you when beach trips go wrong. Number one, Arik Matatov. In July of 2018, the New York Post published an article about a supposedly wheelchair-bound Queens man who was threatening to sue dozens of businesses in the Big Apple for failing to be handicapped accessible. Over a six-week period the previous winter, 24-year-old Arik Matatov had sent letters to 49 businesses demanding $50,000 in order to keep the matter out of the courtroom. Someone tagged along with Matatov as he went to the businesses and had photos of himself taken in front of each store to demonstrate its lack of handicapped accommodations, including ramps and elevators. Matatov's lawyer, Jeffrey Nyman, told the New York Post that his client was looking to have access to places, adding, he's very strong on that, but he wouldn't allow Matatov to be interviewed. And when a Post reporter questioned why Matatov would want to travel from his home in Rego Park, to a bridal shop or a beauty supply store in Manhattan, Nyman simply said he likes to browse. One of the accused stores denied Matatov's accusations that they lacked a wheelchair ramp and sent the post photos to prove otherwise. Several businesses made their entrances handicapped accessible in order to satisfy Matatov's demands or negotiated settlements out of court. Just days after first reporting on Matatov's lawsuits, the Post revealed that he is not wheelchair-bound, like he claimed. A reporter captured photos of him walking during an attempted visit at his home, where he was seen exiting a vehicle and walking toward his apartment. When Matatov realized the media was there, he said he didn't want any photos taken and entered his home with an obviously panicked expression on his face. A short while later, he was seen exiting his apartment once again on foot and getting into a friend's Lexus. 
He used a blind walking cane to feel his way but didn't lean on it for support. Matatov's attorney, Nyman, insisted that he had no idea his client could walk. He vowed to look further into the matter, saying that it's not his style to knowingly pursue false lawsuits. After learning that Matatov had pretended to need a wheelchair, the businesses he sued expressed anger over the hardship that had been inflicted upon them by his frivolous lawsuits. Many of the business owners already felt exploited to begin with, and the discovery of Matatov's fake disability more or less confirmed these suspicions. After being called out on his act, Nyman paused the lawsuits and several of the cases were subsequently dropped. Some of the victims filed court documents accusing Matatov of fraud, but he was never charged with any crimes. Number 7. The Wildwood Beach Arrest a Philadelphia woman was involved in an altercation with police officers on a New Jersey beach during Memorial Day weekend in 2018. A video recording of the incident was widely disseminated online mainly due to the physical manner in which Wildwood officers had remanded the suspect, 20-year-old Emily Weinman, into custody. Law enforcement had reportedly been called to the scene to investigate a potential case of underage drinking. Weinman, who was visiting the Wildwood Beach with her boyfriend, her 18-month-old child and a female friend, was questioned regarding the presence of an unopened alcoholic beverage on the beach. The ensuing confrontation was captured by a nearby beachgoer's cell phone, as well as the arresting officer's body cams. As shown by the footage, Weinman claimed that she hadn't been drinking and repeatedly refused to give the police her full name. The woman then attempted to walk away from the two officers, to which they responded by grabbing and taking her to the ground. One of the men, identified as Officer Thomas Cannon, struck Weinman in the head twice as she was being held down. The woman, who could be heard screaming, they're choking me, as the struggle continued, was alleged to have kicked and spat on the officers during the encounter. Following her arrest, Weinman was charged with several offenses, including aggravated assault, disorderly conduct, and resisting arrest. She ultimately agreed to a plea deal, which decreed that she be placed under probation for one year. The woman was also banned from Wildwood and its beaches for the duration of her sentence. While the officers involved in the altercation were cleared of any wrongdoing, Wyman filed a civil suit with the city of Wildwood, claiming that she'd been brutally and senselessly assaulted during the arrest. The two parties ultimately agreed to a settlement that awarded Weinman $325,000 for her grievances. Number 6. The Murder of Toya Cordingly The body of 24-year-old Toya Cordingly was discovered in the sand dunes of Wangeti Beach, Australia, on October 21, 2018. The woman's father, Troy, was the one who came across her beaten and bruised corpse roughly 12 hours after she had been reported missing to local authorities. Cordingly had reportedly left for the beach with her dog at around 2.30 p.m. on the day of her disappearance. She failed to return home that night and her family contacted the police at 11 p.m. to report her missing. While sweeping through the North Queensland beach the following morning, Troy found her body which had apparently suffered visible violent injuries. Cordingly was a self-described animal lover who'd worked at an animal shelter called Paws and Claws prior to her death. During the ensuing investigation, Australian police identified an individual named Rajwinder Singh as a person of interest in the case. Singh had allegedly traveled to his native country of India on the same day as Cordin Lee's murder, leaving behind his family and job in the city of Cairns. In March of 2021, it came to light that Australian authorities had coordinated with Indian officials in their efforts to issue an extradition order for their prime suspect. The exhaustive process had reportedly been slowed due to the extremely high threshold of evidence that had been required to reach an agreement with the Indian government in order for them to turn Singh over. Number 5. The Kalatorida Accident In January of 2015, a 29-year-old woman plummeted to her death from a beachside cliff in Ibiza as she celebrated her boyfriend's marriage proposal. The victim was identified as Dimitrina Dimitrova, a Bulgarian national who traveled to the Kalatorida Beach Resort to visit her partner, who was reported to have been living and working on the Spanish island. The couple had gone up to the top of the cliff with their two children aged five and six around midday on January the 27th. Dimitrova's boyfriend then surprised her by asking for her hand in marriage. 
to which the woman allegedly responded by jumping up and down in excitement. Following an investigation by local police, it was established that Dimitrova's exuberance had resulted in her losing her balance and tumbling off the cliff's edge, plunging 65 feet to the ground below. Upon impact, Dimitrova reportedly suffered devastating injuries that triggered a heart attack. The woman was unresponsive when paramedics finally reached her body, and she was pronounced dead at the scene. The authorities told the media that there was no evidence of foul play and Dimitrova's tragic death was declared to have been the result of a freak accident. Number 4. Anna Lee Holderman In the summer of 2019, a Connecticut woman exposed herself to a mother and her young child after she'd been confronted about sunbathing topless at Compo Beach in Westport. According to a police report, the incident took place before 1.30 p.m. On July the 15th, the suspect, identified as Norwalk resident Anna Lee Holderman, aged 28, had removed the top of her bathing suit while she was suntanning on the public beach. A female bystander approached a woman and asked that she cover herself, justifying the request by saying there were multiple children present at the scene. An intoxicated Holderman then berated the woman who was with her own child in tow at the time of the confrontation. In a further display of defiance, Holderman pulled down the lower half of her suit, uncovering her bottom as well. The witness subsequently contacted the authorities to report her revealing encounter with the belligerent sunbather. A warrant was issued for Holderman's arrest, and she was ultimately charged with risk of injury to a minor and second-degree breach of peace after she turned herself into the Westport Police. It later emerged that the suspect's father, Robert Holderman, was a former CBS producer who'd faced jail time in 2010 for attempting to extort former late-night television host David Letterman for $2 million. Number 3. The Killing of Antoinette Trabulsi In November of 2020, the dead body of a 52-year-old hospital worker was found on a beach in the resort Cuban town of Varadero. The victim, named as Montreal woman Antoinette Trabulsi, had reportedly traveled to the Caribbean country for a two-week vacation after the coronavirus pandemic had dramatically increased her workload at Sacre Coeur Hospital. According to a report by Global Affairs Canada, the mother of four had gone missing on November 13th, a day after her arrival in Valadero. Trabulsi had posted photos of herself on the beach on the morning of her disappearance. A friend of hers ultimately reported her missing to Cuban authorities later that evening after she'd failed to show up for a scheduled meeting. Within a few days, investigators discovered the woman's body buried beneath three feet of sand on the beach. There were visible bite marks on the victim's chest, and her face had reportedly been brutally beaten. It was reported the following week that Cuban police had identified and apprehended a suspect, but they didn't immediately reveal any details about the individual in custody to the public. Number 2. The Mooney Beach Incident In December of 2018, Two men drowned at Mooney Beach in New South Wales, Australia after jumping in the water to rescue three teenagers who'd been pulled out to sea by a rip current. According to subsequent reports, the family involved in the tragic incident had taken a day trip to the unpatrolled beach in Coves Harbour on the evening of December the 17th. Gahousuddin Muhammad, aged 45, reportedly noticed that his three children, aged 13, 15 and 17, had been swept up in the ocean's turbulent swells. Muhammad and one of his relatives, identified as 35-year-old Saeed Rahath, entered the rough waters in an attempt to save them. Fortunately, all three of the teenagers were successfully pulled from the water and kept in stable condition after being transported to Coves Harbour Hospital. The same could not be said for their rescuers, who were unresponsive upon being recovered from the ocean by emergency responders. Paramedics attempted CPR on both Muhammad and Rahath, but the two men were ultimately pronounced dead at the scene. A third member of the family, Junaid Maud Abdul, also reportedly jumped into the treacherous waters to save the teens. He remained missing for several days before his body was finally discovered in Port Macquarie, roughly 93 miles from where he'd last been seen. New South Wales police reported that a fourth individual, a 60-year-old Swiss national, died at Mooney Beach just five days after the ill-fated holidaymakers. In the aftermath of the drowning incidents, a local aquatic safety trainer named Les Pepper urged Mooney Beach visitors to swim only in the areas that were under the supervision of lifeguards. Number 1. The Jenna Beach Murders A young couple was gunned down as they slept on a beach in the small coastal hamlet of Jenna, California in August of 2004. The bodies of the victims who were identified as 22-year-old Lindsay Cutzel and her fiancé Jason Allen, aged 26, 
weren't found until three days after the shooting had taken place. A helicopter had been dispatched following reports of a man who was stranded on a cliff near Fishhead Beach. The aircraft's pilot spotted Kutzel and Allen while carrying out the unrelated rescue mission, and an investigation into their deaths was subsequently launched by the Sonoma County Sheriff's Department. A ballistics analysis revealed that the double homicide had been carried out with a 45 caliber Marlin Model 1894 long rifle, but detectives struggled to identify any suspects in the early stages of the case. The authorities had quickly ruled out murder-suicide as a possible explanation for the killings and also eliminated robbery from consideration as none of the couple's belongings had been taken. It was later speculated that Cutsall and Allen had been slain by a drifter who'd been walking along the rural stretch of Fishhead Beach where their bodies were discovered. The investigation failed to produce any substantial leads for several years. The couple's murder remained unsolved until May of 2017, whereupon the authorities indicated during a press conference that they'd experienced a breakthrough in the case. The primary suspect named by the police was 38-year-old Sean Gallen of Forestville, who'd previously been arrested for fatally shooting his own brother. In June of 2019, Gallen entered no contest police to charges stemming from the Jenna Beach murders as well as his brother's death. He was sentenced to serve three consecutive life terms without parole and an additional 94 years in state prison. Thanks for watching. Would you rather walk barefoot in a public bathroom or through poison ivy? Let us know in the comments section below.